Great. Hello, everyone. And uh, hope you've had a great day so far. My name so is TJ really Srivanyapuram. I'm a first year yeah, MBA student at MIT Sloan people. and the student lead for the Business of Sports panel. Um, honored to present our panelists today, um, starting from the right. Uh, Cole Gahagan, the Chief Commercial Officer at Fanatics. Don Hudson, EVP and Chief Marketing Officer at the NFL. Matt O'Toole, President of Reebok. Marie Donahue, the EVP of Business Content and Strategy at ESPN. And Maverick Carter, the CEO of Spring Hill Entertainment and The Uninterrupted. Our moderator is Darren Rebell of ESPN. Uh, and uh, so the panel will be about 45 minutes, and we'll have 15 minutes of questions at the end. So please use the hashtag on Twitter, uh, the biz of sports, that's biz with a Z, um, and with any questions, and we'll uh, be sure to get to, to Darren. All right, everyone. That was fantastic. This is, I'm going to have to come here more often where I don't have to introduce the panelists. Uh, this is really great. I'd like to give my Twitter password to someone so that they could tweet some quotes <laughs> while we're doing this. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so this is great to be here. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. I know there's a, you have a choice in uh, analytic travel, and we're glad that you came with us. Uh, so, uh, so let's get started. Um, Cole, I'm going to start with you because I'm excited about what Fanatics is doing in terms of vertical integration. Uh, you guys recently spent $100 million in technology. And it seems like the goal is to, an Odell Beckham catch happens, uh, there's a t-shirt designer within Fanatics that comes up with a design, um, then it's po marketer is you know, posting it on the site, Within a couple minutes, someone can then buy that shirt. Within a couple minutes, you at Fanatics are making that shirt. Within a couple minutes, you are shipping that shirt. And maybe the next morning, after Odell Beckham made that catch, I actually have the shirt. It's pretty f freaky, but you guys, that's the world that you guys are dreaming in now? Yeah, this is, uh, that was the most perfect setup to a question I've ever had because all I have to say is I'm out of here. Yes. That was awesome. <laughs> yes. Uh, that, that you couldn't have, I couldn't have summed it up in any better. I mean, if, you, if you look at our, our, our sports industry, you'd be hard pressed to find um, a, a segment of our business that has, that has sort of lagged behind the on-demand economy as much as the licensing sports business ha has. If you sort of think about those moments, the Odell moments, the mellow trade, the, the Linsanity moments, if you think about all these moments where you have demand that, that, that uh, peaks and spikes at such a massive rate, and the sentiment associated with that demand is unlike any sentiment in any, any other corner of commerce, um, and the fact that we don't have the ability as an industry right now to go and meet that demand, to capitalize on that demand on, on behalf of the, the content rights holders, be it a team, be it a player, be it the league, um, is a bit of a travesty. And so uh, what, what we've done as a, as a company is zoom out and look at that challenge and say, how do we can sort of turn that into an opportunity for all of those stakeholders in the value chain and figure out where we can inject the scale that we have built, uh, the, the, the investments that we've made, where we can begin to inject that to try and fix that problem on behalf of, of the industry. And verticalization became sort of a necessity to do that. To your point, we had to take the end-to-end -end business that we had built. Most people know Fanatics because of Fanatics.com. Most people know Fanatics because I bought a jersey from the NFL store and it was powered by Fanatics. So we had the e -com infrastructure in place, the user experience in place, the customer touch point in place, all the way to the fulfillment of that product, um, but so much in the middle we didn't necessarily have. So getting involved in the wholesale business two years ago like we did. 20 be seconds. Beginning to print, make our own product, put us in a position to be able to change that as you outlined, to be able to build that product quickly, get it on the site quickly, market it in a personalized way, get it in the hands of the fan that care the most about it you know, overnight. So it's been a sort of necessary move to fixing some of those challenges. Awesome, good job, beep, good job. <laughs> uh, let's go to you, Mav. Um, in 1998, there was a site called Broadband Sports, which was basically gonna take away uh, from what journalists were doing and athletes were going to be able to do their own thing and write on their own websites and uh, Ultimately, athletes didn't want to do it. Um, you, with LeBron, um, started uh, a vehicle that uh, is getting attention, uninterrupted, 
uh, raw video from athletes, from the athletes, and it's worked. Um, so besides having LeBron as the athlete that people want to hear, obviously you're featuring people besides LeBron, um, why has it worked? Um, that's a great question. I think to this point what's worked very well for us is the vision of the company, and that's telling great stories with athletes that are authentic and insightful and have some entertainment value to them also. Our goal was never set out to replace ESPN or any other journalist or any other journalistic venture in the world. We, we're not journalism. We look at ourselves more like HBO for athletes. So HBO works with creators, writers, producers, directors, the best ones in the world want to make a show on HBO. We look at athletes in the same way. They all have stories. They want to tell stories. Now, obviously, my partner is LeBron, who has a story that many people know, but there's many facets to his story. But we've also told stories of athletes that many people didn't know. We had a story called Follow Hijab, which is about a, a, a woman who practices Islam who wanted to play in FIBA and wasn't allowed because she wore a hijab. So we told her story, and that story was very authentic. Very, it resonated with people, and it, we got lucky a week later uh, our president put a band, put the band out that really, you know, CNN pulled our story, gravitated to our story. So our goal has always been to allow the athlete to tell their story, and then we put the team around them to help them get that story done. Our, our creative director, Gotham Chopra, is one of the best filmmakers in the world. So when an athlete comes to us with an idea and wants a, has a story that they truly want to tell, we are there to help them tell that story and figure out which medium that story should live in. I want to talk a little bit about niches. Matt, um, if you look at Reebok and kind of the reinvention of Reebok, partly through niches, through CrossFit, through appealing to, to UFC, um, what do you know about your, the, the CrossFit environment by getting into that? Um, and how has that changed how you do business by kind of segmenting to one group? Yeah, I think that it's really um, our focus on CrossFit and a lot of other fitness communities is built on a, I think a basic uh, piece of conventional wisdom that uh, is happening in the market today that it's really about personalizing and customizing the experience for the consumer. And the idea that uh, a big sports brand like Reebok can have some kind of a singular message that appeals to all consumers or fans or whatever it is out there right now isn't really a possibility, um, even if we did want to market that way. And what we found is by focusing on these communities who have like-minded people who are coming together with the same purpose, that there's a much stronger connection to the brand and uh, also a stronger connection to continuing uh, their activity. So this is definitely kind of the overall blueprint for our brand as we're going forward. And, uh, and we're seeing that now if you put enough of these communities together, you can really create scale. And CrossFit's a, a great example. By the way, I'm admiring the freshness of your kicks right there, the 1985, like, original like Reeboks, and I like your... Uh, the Blazers. The Blazers. That's a 1970, a remake nice of the 1977 yeah. Blazers. Uh, That's pretty impressive. That's own, called Matt, the Blazers, yeah. Matt, is, is uh, just one thing I want to ask, is that a little bit of the her from the heritage of the company, too? Obviously, Reebok, you guys kind of got your start in aerobics and as a fitness brand that I don't know how many people know. Is that tying yeah. back to some of the I, heritage? That's actually a great question because it's uh, it's the case. I, the <laughs> I didn't mean to steal you, Sean, but, but I was, I'm not better than yours. Yeah. This is yeah. how I learned. I'll allow it, but this is not how I than the moderator. <laughs> this is but, how I uh, learned. But definitely, I mean, Reebok became a big player on the global scene by really embracing women's fitness, which was a group fitness activity, a social activity, um, and it was a, right after Title IX giving women permission to sweat, to work out, to have muscles. And I think this is exactly what's happening today, but in different activities where people are finding the secret sauce to actually being active is communities. And that's what happened with women's fitness in the 80s, and that's definitely what's happening today. So, You guys have built some pretty impressive shoes, the J.J. Watt shoe for $99. That might be one of the best shoes on the market, so congratulations. And possibly the fittest athlete in the NFL, too. Uh, but yeah, J.J. was a big part You could take away that. possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I will take possibly out of that. <laughs> uh, Marie, let's talk about ESPN. Um, I just Should we disclose? I was going to say, here comes the softball. Her name is on my checks? No. <laughs> uh, no, it won't be soft. Uh, let's, let's talk about ESPN, and I want to hit on kind of the idea of niches. Mm -hmm. 538, 
undefeated. Um, and, and the idea that, yes, we're the big ESPN, but we're defining uh, you know, how people are coming to our, a certain space. So tell me about the sites like, like uh, 538, like Undefeated, and what the goals are to creating those sites that are separate from the big monolithic, monolithic ESP. Right, well, ultimately, if we're doing our job right, they're not separate, because a lot of why we started those sites was to bring certain talent and perspective um, into ESPN. So um, you'll notice you'll see the talent and uh, the content across our platforms. Uh, I probably only have 30 seconds. No, so no, I'll, I'll tell I'll you when you need to go. <laughs> so I'll, do, I'll, I'll give, as an example, the undefeated. We started the undefeated for a very practical reason. We over-index uh, with African Americans on television and we under-indexed on digital. Hmm. So it was clear we, we hire an awful lot. That's a good analytic, by the way. <laughs> We, we certainly feel we serve, we felt we served that audience and we, we, we didn't think it was a diversity issue at the company really, but we weren't accomplishing what we, want, what we needed to on digital. So we uh, decided we would create a site that was managed and um, the editorial sensibility would be from that, uh, from that staff. And so we have a staff that's primarily African American, it's over half women, um, and we found Number one, the very practical issue, we're serving that audience better, we think, but also as sports, race, and culture start, start to collide as issues, we needed smarter, more sophisticated, insightful ways to address those issues. And so we needed those people, that staff, um, at our company. And it's, I, I'm very biased, but I think it's been a huge success just by looking at the staff we've hired. We've, we've got Kevin Merida, who was 20-something years at the Washington Post, Bill Roden, we just announced he came on last week and we're doing a Roden Fellows, so he's going to mentor young journalists. We've got Danielle Smith, who's a pioneer in the music business and as an editor of Billboard and Vibe and also is an amazing, one of my favorite writers. So I think just getting those people into our company, the undefeated has been an unqualified success. The, the next level, what we have to do is ensure it's across our platforms. And it's not a niche for us because you don't have to be African American to appreciate the undefeated. You may have a slightly different reaction to it or you might feel a little more personal connection, but everything we put on that site is high quality and can give you um, an added perspective about sports, race, and culture. So we're really proud of it. Dawn, uh, the NFL is the No Fun League, is it? I love working for the No Fun League. <laughs> <laughs> we relish being called the No Fun League. Uh, no, it's not. No, as, a mean, head, as a head marketer, I mean, does that you know, drive you it, nuts? Or it, what drives me, well, no, it doesn't drive me nuts, but it's not true. And uh, I understand why they say that, because we're a league that has had some success in controlling what happens on the field and having a unified set of 32 teams and I understand that. I think it's more um, symbolic of the fact that, I mean, the thing that bothers me more is that our fans and to some extent our players think that, our, that, that everyone at the league, they love football and they love the teams and they love the players and they love the game, but the NFL, people who work at the NFL, they're in the business of football and all we care about are deals. And that's not true. There's former players or people like me that came in because we just love the game. So that bothers me, and I think we have an opportunity to kind of share our passion more. Because if you do work at the NFL, we're a pretty passionate group of people that love football. Why would we work there otherwise? What about the idea that uh, I, I guess the the cleat thing was pretty impressive? That what was that? What was that called? The cleat. My cause, my, my cleats. My cause, my cleats. Because people had always said. Well, that's kind of an in-your-face of the No Fun League because, oh, every time someone trots out some, some cleats that they get fined. But now you created week 13 of the NFL where you are actually behind the idea of these guys putting out a charity or something and, and, and having it on their cleats. So how did that work out and how did that also serve the purpose of saying, you know, no, we aren't? So, so it was interesting. The genesis of the idea was... Uh, about a dozen players sitting around the table saying, what can we do better together? And the players, you know, footwear, footwear is fashion, right? And the, the players talking about how they, the majority of them are involved in a charity, whether they created their own or they're involved, very passionate and spend a ton of their time outside the field 
working in the PAC and the charities, and they, they hunger to get more visibility outside their market for what they're doing. So they were talking to us about that, and um, so we said, well, what could we do? And we talked about it, and we talked about, well, what if we pick a weekend? And we make it a weekend where, because as, as a person responsible for growing the fan base, I know fans, particularly younger fans, they thrill in what makes people different. They want to know what people are into. They want to know how their training regiments are different. They want to know what kind of shoes they wear. And so we thought it'd be a great fan engagement, and it would give the players representation and ability to have voice. So we put the two together and gave a weekend and actually hopefully showed we're not I mean, we let the field be messy. That was the idea. You know, let everybody go out there and, and do their own thing. And we asked it to be a 5013C, and then we, we found we wanted, and importantly, we wanted players to tell their stories. Why did they get involved with this? What do they do to be able to post what they did, you know, on a, on a Monday after a game? It turned out to be probably the most impressive league-wide talk from all these players ever about their causes. They couldn't believe, some of them couldn't believe we did it. Yeah. And, uh, but what, what I liked about it, we honestly didn't overmarket it either. We just let it happen. It, authenticity is so important today. You know, we're all talking about that one-to-one -one marketing, making sure you get the right thing for the right person, being authentic, telling the stories. And I think that was the beauty of it. The players wanted to show what they're involved in. They were allowed to tell their story. We didn't tell them how to design their shoe. You know, I had the marketing directors, the clubs, encourage them to connect people with local artists or do whatever they could. And, and I think that next year, uh, you're likely to see it back, and it's likely to be even bigger, because we have 500 players. I think everybody now is thinking ahead. Oh, what am I gonna do? Cole, how does data impact your decisions? Obviously, you have this information now of who's buying, where they're buying from, how they're buying, when they're buying, uh, and you guys have kind of done some things with knowing that, where it's kind of counterintuitive. All of a sudden, you're now doing deals with teams, and you're doing brick and mortar type stores, which seems like that would be completely against uh, an online juggernaut. But tell me what type of, specifically with that, tell me what type of information you get in the data flow that says, no, we got to go backwards to the older ways. Yeah, whatever data we have is not serving me well because all this shoe talk and I'm rocking some basic Kohan loafers. Oh, uh, your name's Cole. Really, ma really making me uh, <laughs> self-conscious about my decisions, at least in the fashion front. Uh, look, we, we you have live, a nice watch on. We, well, that helps. Um, <laughs> what brand is it? I'm going to cover this. Uh, that's a Seiko. Okay. Cover nice. that up. It looks nice from afar, at least. Thank you. Thank you. I feel a little better now. <laughs> um, we, look, we, we, we live in analytics on an everyday basis, whether it's quant marketing, whether it's, it's sort of dictating how we buy. Um, you touched on something sort of interesting, you know, probably one of the biggest areas of right now data infusion for us is on what we buy. Obviously, we, we are fortunate to have mountains of data on buying behaviors, which tells us that uh, pretty empirically that there's a certain subset of products that sell for a team or for a league. Even though we may carry 2,000 styles for a given team, in reality, it may be 117 of them make up the 80-20 rule, right? That those are the 117 that, that over and over the fans are buying. The challenges that we realized the industry faced was that we had that information and it was informing what we bought for e-commerce, but we weren't seeing that on the brick and mortar side. And in the in the in venue stores um, specifically, they, they did those stores weren't privy to the same data and the same insights. So it really, again, shined a light on an opportunity for us to take these learnings and scale and say, how do we go deliver those to a store, and then suddenly you unlock a world of omni-channel possibilities, right? You start to say to the fan, hey, if you see it online, and it happens to be part of that 117 products that make up that 80-20 rule, you're gonna see it in the, in the store as well. And oh, by the way, you can buy online and pick up in the store, or buy in the store and, and ship home. So without the understanding of those buyer behaviors, we wouldn't be able to go and deliver that service to the fan. Dawn, you have a follow-up off no, I, I was just only gonna comment, somebody, you know, uh, only in the sports industry for a couple of years, uh, and you commented on an area where sports can catch up. I see data and analytics, and Jessica's here, is, is there's so much data and analytics in the sports business, but what you in the, in the fashion and in the, in, the, in the digital world, what you're doing is you're, you're emotionally connecting with individual consumers on what matters to them. And I think that, at least my experience with sports so far, is that we're still highly transactional 
And if you look at classic fashion brick and mortar retailers, they've learned how to take um, what they create and their knowledge around a consumer and, and they present it in a way that makes it feel like it's tailored to them. It's not just right now you can go buy a shirt. It's, it's I understand your lifestyle, I understand your mindset, I, I understand that you connect through football because you like getting the family together and you connect with football because you play fantasy and you really love stats. I gotta tailor my messages. So I, I do think that the industry is really gonna grow in the next couple of years to not only harness data for sales, but harness data for those emotional connections that drive us. That drive us. That's what our sport, sport is all about. Matt, you have insight? Well, I was just gonna say, I think this is, this is huge, what you both are talking about, in that it's, there's kind of a, a counter action to our whole kind of hyper-connected digital world where there is you know, more data than anybody can actually use or get the kind of information that we need that is really human-to-human -human connection. And uh, a big focus for our brand is this idea of being more human. And so to have physical brick-and-mortar stores, you can look eye-to-eye -eye with a consumer and have a much more personal experience, or you can find out more about what that kind of community connection is that's required. And I think that brands like ours are going to have to figure out, um, yes, we're going to be able to serve up personalized content. Yes, we're going to be able to recommend other activities that are similar to the activities that you do. But we've got to bring in ways that you actually feel like you had a human connection again, because there is this growing need in all this kind of connectivity that we have digitally to actually you know, see human emotions, to touch someone else. And I think that um, you know, there was a survey recently that said that uh, the younger you are, the less likely you are you to be. You can't say there's a survey recently anymore, not in 2017. <laughs> okay. All right, what do, you, what, do you write? what do you want as a lead into that? But anyway, that the younger you are, the less likely you are to be empathetic. And what that, the conclusion of the survey was simply that because you don't see the reaction of people's faces or their physical reactions, that we're really losing the human connection. I think our jobs in this kind of data-driven world is to connect to the human still and make those connections possible. It's, it's interesting, it's a, it's, it's a job, it, it's, it's almost a responsibility, I mean, if, it, yeah. it, meaning, we, all of us on this stage and a number of us in the audience and a number of you guys who want to get into this business, um, we're, we're all in a space where, as I sort of mentioned before, arguably the sentiment for the brands that are involved is unrivaled in any other organized business. I mean, if you think about the sentiments for these brands that all of us, you know, for the most part, either represent or orbit in some way, um, people are crazy passionate about their teams, which means that, and, 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 and the leagues and the teams, and multiple teams for that matter, which makes it incumbent upon us to understand what those passions are and how they've translated into their actions, whether it's buying, whether it's attending a game or event, and then to make sure we constantly serve things up to them that are fresh and new that continue to build on that sentiment. It's sort of a responsibility that we, that we have. Murray, how, how do you uh, make sure that that the passion and those great stories are either told in the right format or told in all formats, right? Like, so you have the vehicles that are .com, that are the 30 for 30 in films, that, you know, audio, podcast. I mean, I'm, I'm in the machine of just pitching a story, but how you, the blimp view, like make sure that those stories are told in the formats that will touch fans the best? Ultimately, we rely largely on the creators. Um, so I hope you have a strong point of view about how to tell your story. And, and ultimately, we follow the creators. But it's also important for us to continue um, to expand and try new formats. We, you know, we have 30 for 30. Then we, we want to keep that fresh. We always have new filmmakers, uh, diverse, different stories. And we, we tried a crazy eight and a half hour OJ Simpson. Um, documentary. It's one Oscar. film, just eight. And, thank you. Just eight and a half hours, and we do shorts. And now we're doing thirty for thirty podcasts. So it's actually a challenge because we have so many opportunities. Um, but I think ultimately you have to rely on the creative vision of the folks who are creating it. What is? I, I always have. To, I think people want to hear this, but it might not be an analytics question. But what does a LeBron deal look like these days? From, from your perspective, obviously, you guys were founders of Beats. Um, the Apple deal happened. I, I feel like LeBron and you are asking more of companies that want your attention. It's not an endorsement deal. It's a partner. More than anyone has ever asked in the history of company-athlete 
relations, which is a credit to you. But what is a what is a conversation with a potential partner look like? Well, I would say the first thing is we. I mean, the honest truth is, and, and we started this when LeBron and I started as partners when I left Nike to be his partner in 04. We don't, we don't never really ask. It's more of a conversation about being partners. It's not us going, we'll do this and you'll give us this. It's more us going, how the hell are we going to build something great? How are we going to build Beats Electronics? How are we going to build the LeBron brand with Nike? Um, so it's less about us asking for things. It's more about us figuring out how are we going to build things with a partner? How are we going to build uninterrupted with Warner Brothers? Warner Brothers is our partner. We didn't go to them and say, you know, asking or begging for anything or saying, hey, we're going to do this and you give us that. We went to them saying, we have a vision. We want to build this company. Do you want to be our partner? And they said, yes. And then we said, okay, so here's what we're going to bring. Here's what we're going to do. Mav's going to run it. And here's what you know, we'd like for you guys to come in and be partners. And they said, okay, here's what we can bring to the table. Here's what we can't do, here's what we can do. So it's not about us asking. I would say, you know, LeBron is a very special guy, obviously, and what we've done is very special. It's different than any other athlete, probably of all time, all the athletes that you cover. And obviously, I love Darren, but I've had a lot of frustrating moments with Darren. Um, because you, won't, you look at things through that lens, and I try to explain to you with Darren, LeBron, I don't do things the way David Falk and Michael Jordan did them, or the way you know, Rob Palenka or Kobe Bryant. We've always looked at things from the beginning a very different way. We don't go in asking for this. We say, hey, we want to build something great. Whether that's advertising, whether that's a digital media company, a media company, or a, a he headphone company, and we say, hey, we want to be partners with you. And if you, you're not interested in that, then we're not interested in being in business with you. Can I be partners in Space Jam 2 if you have a reporting role in the Space Jam 2? As long as you don't tweet it until I tell you. OK, all right. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. Exactly. Uh, th here, here, this is kind of a, a strange question, but it's part of this, the analytics theme. Um, I always love pieces of data that surprise you, that you think your editor knows something, and you think there's a part of the story, and then all of a sudden, it's weird and wacko. And, and I, I, I do love data. It should be a bumper sticker. Um, but uh, so one of the stories was that the there, that 10 years ago there was a panic in the Bay Area because one of the baseball teams had run out of plastic bags, and the reason why this was an issue was because they had signed an Asian player, and each uh, each time a person had come over from Asia, they insisted that every jersey that they bought of this player be each in an individual plastic bag. Because that proves that, that it was bought from the official store. The receipt doesn't, nothing else does, you can't hand them the. So what piece of data have you seen that has surprised you? And have you ever acted on it? Well, I think one of the most you know, surprising things that, uh, you know, we're, we're in the business of getting people moving in, in fitness and life, and um, we're looking at every possible way to kind of connect with our consumer. And probably one of the biggest trends right now is to wear some kind of uh, device on your wrist to count uh, how many steps or calories or your heartbeat. Um, but the more we look into the data behind these devices, the more we're finding out that uh, they either have no effect or they're actually um, having a negative effect. That people are, because they can look at their wrist and say they did so many steps in a day, feeling more permission to eat more or work out less. And um, so kind of some things are kind of counterintuitive. While I didn't, I didn't want to know that I only sleep three hours and 25 <laughs> yeah. minutes. And only 30 yeah. minutes of that was deep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, another interesting part of that is like the average life of these devices now is, is, is something like 75 days. And that's before they end up in your junk drawer. So what we're trying to figure out is, okay, what are the things that actually do keep you moving? And, and I think there's a whole area to mine. We, we've made a partnership with a, an app called Handstand that's really about getting people connected, working out together, and that kind of physical connection I talked about before. Yeah, I, I mean, to your point, I would say, is there a piece of data, by the way, like LeBron's second most fans come from a certain portion of Thailand? Like something weird that you? There's, I mean, just building off what Matt was saying. Oh, I'm sorry. You can ignore me. That's OK. Yeah, I mean, 
the whole thing, and, and your question about like all of this data, there's all this data all over the world. There's like, you know, we were having a discussion earlier, like when an athlete's competing in a sport, who owns the, the data that they're generating? Their heart rate, their sweat, their this. Does the league own it? Does the player own it? Does, you know, the, Nike's making the NBA uniforms, do they own it? Nike makes it info. So, but there's all this data, but the fact of the matter is, to, to Matt's point earlier in the business that I'm in is connecting with people emotionally and really telling them stories and getting them moving in a way that, that you can't measure. It's, a, it's, it's, it's making them move to, to go see something or purchase something or, or have a feeling that they couldn't otherwise. So is data yeah. a negative in that no, sequence? No, data's not necessarily a negative, but to his point, like wearables, I've always had arguments with wearables or people into wearables. When, when Nike was introducing the fuel band, the gentleman who made it, he and I were in the Nike lab. And I was having this, we had this big uh, knockdown drag out argument because I was saying, okay, fine. I'm gonna wear the, the, the wrist, the thing on my wrist. It's, if I go to the gym, and I'm done, and I'm sweating like crazy, and I can't off. breathe, I don't need your thing on my wrist to right. tell me I worked out really hard. Right. I know I worked out really hard because I can't breathe. And then if it does tell me I didn't work out hard enough, okay, what do I do about it? It's not telling me what to do. It's not telling me what to do. So it's the same thing in any business. Like, you can get all the data, but how do you mine through it, and then what's the reaction to it is actually what, you need, what we need to figure out. Because just collecting data, just to say you have it, doesn't really change anything. You know, can, I get, wait, can I get some iPad assistance here? <laughs> I'm only, oh, I just got, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> right. I'll give you a weird thing that came up last night. We had the 538 guys at a, at a dinner with some clients and Nate Silver explained that at 538, which you would think is staffed by all data people, it's 80% editors and about 20% people who work in data because just this very point, you have to figure out, it's figuring out how to use the data, how to, t how to use, tell stories with the data is a lot harder than actually getting the data most times. By the way, if you guys haven't read the story on 538 about what Waffle House closings tells you about weather, that, and I'm, I'm not being promotional because 538's owned by ESPN, you just that love Waffle single, House. That is the single best story I've read all year. It's so what's the connection? Well, the Waffle House is going to have to read it. No, you're going to have to read it. Uh, it's 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 an awesome story about kind of because Waffle House is always open 24/7. When they close, it shows how bad the weather really is. That's the that's the so it's um, it's oh. really bad weather. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you, Dawn, about, you know, we're getting more data points now, not only who bought the ticket, but now as tickets are turning into digital um, and there's more kind of, uh, we now can see data better than ever before. We know more about who's actually sitting in the seat. Um, what, are we, what are we doing with this data and how good is the opportunity of seeing everything and knowing who the fan is at the game now? So I want to, it's true we're getting more and more data about who sits in the seat. We're also getting more and more data about who watches an entire game, who watches a piece of it. How many devices do they have on while they watch the game? What's the content they go to on their mobile device? And is it different on an iPad versus a smartphone? So you're getting all of this data. And in, in the world of marketing, you know, we, we judge success in the world of marketing, over 50% of the dollars marketers spend across all companies, not so much sports, but all companies, is spent digitally. And people look at, you know, did, did somebody click it? Did they see it? OK, that's reach. Well, I click a lot of things I don't really care about. So then it's do I click through and do I see something else? Or how much time did I spend with you? Sometimes people have 10 seconds. Sometimes they have eight and a half hours. You, know, you have to have the right content for the right. But I, I just feel that all this data is in service of experience and making sure you're connecting the right content, the right experience to the right types of consumers. So I'll tell you in a stadium, fans that are in the nosebleed seats were paid 25 bucks to stand in the, in the area. They're not sharing socially out as much as the fans that are sitting down in the boxes. 
Because there's like an embarrassment factor of I'm not going to take myself. Even though those right. guys are called the real fans. Right. But they're, they're every bit as much fans. But we got to think about how do you make that experience right for them? And what are you sending them in content? What are you giving them? Because I think that is the beauty of sports. It is, it is passion. It is live. It's, it's the athletes. And the opportunity of data is, yeah, data to know what they're doing and they're buying, but data to tailor an experience that makes their interaction with your sport better or interaction with your shoe. I love that shoe. I, I hate to say it's it. It's the Club I C. The well, I grew up on Hendrick that shoe. Hendrick Lamar's wearing it right now, too. I would also, so. I would it's also, only $85. I would also say uh, to Don's. Is it Dan, 100 65 uh, okay. to, to Don's point in the world of marketing, the thing in the world of marketing, when you're marketing something, a big company, or, or it, you could, I always use the example of music. If you get two artists, if, if Bono and Jay-Z make a song together, that song is going to get played all over the world on every radio station. They can get booked. No matter on, how bad it is. They can get booked on David Letterman, I mean, on Saturday Night Live. They can get booked everywhere. It doesn't make the song good. So if, if, if Pepsi, we're used to work at, does an ad, and put, they can put a shitload of money behind it and get it played everywhere, but what always stands the test of time is if it's good. Yeah. If it's good, it will last forever. And if it's not, the data will tell you at the beginning that it's really good and it's big and it's doing well. Every radio station is playing the song, but it doesn't tell you that every time the song comes on, three people in the car go, shit, I hate right, this right, song. Right, right, right. I'm sick of hearing this song. I hate that commercial. I'm sick of seeing this commercial, but if it's Pepsi putting their, their budget behind Diet Pepsi, which you're going to see it. So the data may say, yeah, it's being seen. People are watching it. People are clicking it. That doesn't mean it's good. Right. Obviously, Mountain Dew is going to have 200 million in sales. They put 180 million in marketing. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Do you guys, did it, do you sell any of your data, Cole? Uh, good person. Question. Personally, no. I don't sell any data at all. Uh, I'm not. I'm not out um, peddling. This fanatics is that a business? Peddling data? No, we don't. Okay. We, we don't. We don't sell our our, um, our fan data, uh, and for all the I think the right the right reasons. Okay. We ready to go to some questions? Okay, they're on here. So, uh, if I can operate an iPad. Okay, here we go. Um, all right. Let's see here. Um, what is the worst sports business decision you've made and what did you learn from it? Me? Everyone's going to answer that. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, what is the worst sports business decision I made and what did I learn from it? Well, I, I, I've had a lot of bad decisions, so I've got to sift through them. Um, LeBron Bubblicious? Yeah, that wasn't me actually. That okay. was before me, but that that was not great. The gum was pretty um, good. I'll tell lemonade you, lemonade flavor. It was a pretty good yeah, gum. Yeah, I'll tell you. I spent time when I first started my business um, back in oh four oh five. I spent time thinking I was going to build a management company and manage many more athletes, and I went around um, recruiting Running, athletes, yeah. and um, I chased my tail a lot. I actually did, and spent a lot of time chasing down a business because I believed. Did you get Ted Ginn, though? Yeah, I represented him <laughs> years ago. But I believe that was the business that was meant for me, that that's what I should be doing. And what I quickly learned was that, in actuality, the better idea for me was to do what we've done, and that's build businesses with LeBron. And, and what I learned is that it's not about what is going to be perceived as the right thing because I thought I wanted to be perceived as a guy who managed many athletes. It's more about what's what's the upside versus the downside. And I learned that not just only in business, but in every decision in life, you're always measuring the ups versus the downs. So whether it's Ted Ginn or someone else, the upside wasn't there. The downside, there was there was not enough upside to cover my downside. No matter what I did, if he went on to be this athlete went on or this one female athlete became the greatest in their sport. I was going to do better and build a bigger business if LeBron and I did exactly what I explained to you earlier, went out and built our own businesses. Instead of trying to build an, another athlete's business, if we went out and became partners in Beach Electronics, or we bought Cannondale Bikes and, and built that. So I learned that very quickly, that, you know, chase the things that are the, the, keep the main thing the main thing, that have much bigger upside than downside. And you have to always 
find that balance and measure that with every single decision. Marie? Uh, I have a lot to choose from. Uh, so I'll pick one I think that uh, hopefully will help some of the young business students in the audience. Um, and I've done it several times, negotiating too hard. I've, we've, we've done deals where we've made an awful lot of money, but in the end, the, the, the partner can't pay because we over-negotiated and we, we, we uh, thought they would figure out how to pay. And it's always a lot easier to renew than find a new partner. So um, we've done that several times. Um, I would also say in terms of We've taken the so check. So what's the lesson in that? To the lesson, fi find the right partner. The right partner at the right price. Right. And you, you know, you, you, you can tell what, what a win-win is, and you can tell when you're taking every crumb. Don't take it all off the table. Yeah, which is uh, something young business folks tend to do. And we've also, um, early in my career, we had some examples where we took the best financial deal, but it wasn't the right solution, tech, whether it be technology or partner. And so just look, look beyond the dollars and, and make sure you're picking the right partner. Matt? I love that one, by the way, because I think sure. that's, a, that's a really big thing to think about is what, how each side gets what they need in their relationship, uh, similar to kind of what you were saying earlier. Um, exactly what so I was. I've been in this business for 30 years, so I've got a long list. Um, but uh, I would say that for me, there's two big buckets. Um, very rarely should a brand sign a lifetime contract with anybody. Except yep. LeBron and <laughs> Except I said very rarely, right? And, uh, and then the other thing I, it, I think is the mistakes that I've been involved with from like a product creation point of view, which is the core of our business, are the times when we think about something that we can physically do. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have this pump technology. It can make the fit of your shoe better. But uh, some engineers came and said, hey, we can actually pump up the underfoot of your foot so you can get you know, up or down, taller or shorter. Um, and that's cool. And it is, in fact, cool, but nobody cares. And uh, the fact is we didn't really take the time to understand, was it a value to that athlete? Did it really make an athlete better? And I think any time that we stray from really focusing on what the athlete needs, um, and that's why we're so passionate about the sports that we're in, is that's when I, we make mistakes. Dawn? So I'm, I'm uh, sort of reflecting over sort of my many iterations of my career. So I wouldn't say it's just specific to sports, but I, I would very much say do things for the right reasons long term and think about not just act first with the money. I, I do think that. We sound like uh, The Bachelor a little bit, but for but, the right reasons. But I guess what I've learned is um, to use your common sense that uh, I recall a time, this is, this is going to be a Pepsi story, but uh, Pepsi really wanted to come up with its own lemon lime because uh, the Pepsi system was carrying seven up and we wanted to have our own lemon lime there. And uh, joined, and, and there was a project going on, and uh, they had done a lot of research, and the research was focused on how can you make a lemon lime that's different. So I got there, we were testing, they were all excited to testing this product called Storm. And they had put tons and tons of caffeine in it because people wanted caffeine. Um, and so they said, I like a lemon lime with a caffeine. Common sense, when you just step back, I want some caffeine. I can have a cup of coffee. I'm going to have an energy drink. Yeah, people said they wanted caffeine, but in, in fairness, that whole category is about something you can drink at night so you can fall asleep, something you give your kids so they don't like crazy run around the house crazy. And so I just, I, I learned to apply a common sense metric that does this really make sense? Is this really right for the category? And, and, I, and I try to do that kind of in the sports world too. The second thing, because I couldn't decide between the two, is don't make decisions by committee. Mm -hmm. Particularly in this one-on-one -on -one world, you try to satisfy everybody, you end up with something that connects with nobody. Uh, most recent worst decision that I've made is being um, the one dude up here who didn't wear cool shoes. And uh, that's been- Enough. Do I have to get you counseling yeah, after I this? I feel bad about that. Uh, <laughs> I do really love Matt's shoes. Um, I'm appreciating all the attention. Yeah, wow. good, good brand love for Reebok. And, and like uh, this I know, do you have a new one every day? Because Yeah, perfect. they don't look they're as good when they have a they spot of dirt. Yeah, yeah. He just we, broke we are fortunate enough to have new ones pretty regularly. He's got access. Yeah. He has access. Um, no, look, I, I think one of the, the, the most consistent threads you've heard through all of the answers so far is that, um, sadly, we've all been doing this long enough to have made a whole lot of mistakes and a whole lot of bad decisions. Um, and I would echo a lot of what's been said already. The two things that I would add to it would be, one, um, 
never, it's a little bit building off of what Marie said. You can't be afraid to walk away from a deal. And far too often I've seen bad deals done because of the fear of not being able to enter into that partnership or bring that brand on board or have that deal uh, on, the, on the, the winning board. And in reality, every bad deal sets up the next bad deal. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, especially in a room full of really good analytical minds, um, never try your best to, to, to not get caught into analysis to paralysis. Because that can really happen. You can overanalyze any situation. And this find applies yourself. to your brackets next week. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Add, add, find a way to add gut to it and bring that, that analysis to a short end so you can make decisions and move on. And you will make mistakes, as we all have. But you'll at least move on, learn from those mistakes, and then act on them thereafter. And, and from Coles, uh, because he's with Fanatics now, uh, Michael Rubin, who founded Fanatics and its predecessor, he was not scared to make mistakes. So the idea where he would actually, before you can do what you do now, which is you know, print everything on demand, he would buy the inventory. So when I went down to their warehouse, I saw about 5,000 Jeremy Lin Knicks dolls, but that was okay because you can make mistakes. And at That's the right. end, you're still gonna have more winners than losers if you're doing it right. Uh, Maverick, I gotta ask you this one because LeBron is probably definitely an aggregate, the most popular U.S. athlete, at least, on social media. Uh, Snapchat's been getting a lot of attention because of its IPO. Um, do you have any insight as to whether Snapchat will become more important for sports, whether it will be more of a priority for a guy like, because LeBron's got to choose, right? I mean, he can do all three. He can do Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, but um, any insight on Snapchat? And as a producer of content, what the challenges are versus the other mediums? Yeah, I think, at Uninterrupted, we've been in a lot of conversations with Snapchat. I know those guys very well because we're based in LA and so are they. I think Snapchat is very focused on sports. Um, how they attack it today, I think will look much different than in six, 12, 18 months. They've obviously, de they're developing a, a thought around original content, around, you know, they had a show around politics. I think they're gonna get more into sports. We've actually, been talking with them about creating a show. Um, I don't interrupt it with them on Snapchat. So I think Snapchat is going to get very focused on sports. They have a group dedicated to it, led by God, led by Juan and John, who are great guys. And I think Snapchat will become, you know, more and more important. It's already very important to um, younger kids who are who are on it every single day. And I think their their strategy and their focus is gonna change over the next six to 12 months. Obviously, they've IPO'd now, and they're getting funds in, they're gonna change their thinking, they're gonna hire more people, so my bet would be, absolutely, they're gonna be extremely important to sports. This conference probably has a higher proportion of students or people who are coming here to change careers or try to get into sports, so I wanna end with this, and I've allotted eight minutes, so you can say what you want here. Um, what is the best piece of advice that you have for someone who either wants to get into sports, is going into sports, wants to be in their dream job in sports? What's the best piece of advice you've heard or that you can impart to them? Start with Cole. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I think the one thing that I would say, and I've heard that question asked several times today, so I wanna try and avoid copycatting any answers. But the one thing that I would say is, um, be assertive. This industry is an industry that's filled with personalities and candidly some egos, um, uh, understandably so. Um, and to break through those personalities and to break through and, and shine amongst some of those egos, you can't be afraid to be assertive. You, you, you want to, in a humble, uh, respectful way, speak up, share your point of view, share the thoughts that you have, the ideas um, that you bring to the table, because in many cases those will be appreciated and, and um, and taken into a account if not applied. So um, in this unique business of ours, raise your hand, be assertive. Dawn? My, uh, my advice um, would be, I hear a lot of people say I want to get into sports. I think that you should figure out what do you want, you know, what do you want to do within sports? And I always tell people develop a hip pocket skill. You can get into sports through the finance department and, and really knowing how to drive analytics. You can get in through marketing. You can get in through being an events person. But sometimes to really get a great job in sports, you actually have to start somewhere else and develop that skill that sports can really use. 
as opposed to just generically, I want to get into sports. And I, and I think it builds your career better if you think through a lens of what skill am I developing and how am I applying it in a sports world? Yeah, maybe to build on Don, I would say like a lot of times I uh, hear people say that, you know, my passion is sports, I love sports, and um, I want to be in. And I think what, what has the question that this person needs to ask themselves is, okay, but what do you really want to be doing on a daily basis? Because you will not be on the field or on the court, or you will actually be doing, you'll be in sales, or you'll be in accounting, or um, you'll be part of a digital team, or whatever it is. But I think it's much more important to decide like what, what it is you actually want to be doing. And then the second question I would say is, what kind of environment do you want to be doing it in? I think that uh, there are extremely different cultures in different sports uh, organizations, in, whether they're brands or uh, media outlets or whatever it might be. And I think that's where I would do a lot of your research too about what is the kind of culture that you want to be living in in your sports career. Uh, right. I, would, I would do all those things. Um, also, I, I tend to go back to the golden rule, kind of. It, it, be a nice person, treat people well, because sports is so hard to get into. You don't know who you're talking to today who may end up having a job at a team that you want to work at. Um, and uh, getting to know people matters a lot, but, but what really matters is whether they want to work with you every day. And, and I think in life, I always go to the golden rule, whether it be working in sports or having a happy life, having good friends. Golden rule. Yeah. I would say, um, building off of what Don said when she said, have a hip pocket skill, you guys are all wondering around this conference and probably several others, and whether you're looking to change or you're a young person looking to get into the sports in industry or anyone, I would say have a hip pocket skill for sure. But in that hip pocket also, as you're floating around this conference, you're gonna meet fantastic people like the people I'm on this panel with and others who are extremely, very uberly successful at their jobs. Understand what part of the sports world you wanna get into, don't be so general. And understand, so if there's a part of it that you wanna get into it that one of us represent, come to us and we've all had failures as we talked about, but, but more than likely we've all had many more successes than failures, that's why we're sitting here, and know our successes and ask us about those. Because I will tell you, the way I learned, I taught myself, is by meeting successful people and asking them about their successes. Because when a person's successful, the thing they want to talk about the most is their successes. And there's a lot to learn about. And a person can tell you they're going to give you 10 minutes. And the minute you ask them, well, when you did that thing and it worked out and you made $100 million for your company, you already got 30 minutes. You ask them the next thing, you're gonna get next thing you know, a person told you they're gonna give you 10 minutes, you got two hours because you just focus on their successes, but you have to know what their successes are. And then you focus on their failures and you got a great story. I'm no, just yeah. kidding. And then you send uh, them to Darren and he <laughs> pays you for the uh, my, uh, my piece of advice is uh, use paper. And that is, you know, we have so much that's going on electronically, everything's in the air. Um, Write a note. Uh, the, a note has value to someone, greater value than ever before. Uh, if you're going to send something, don't fax it or fax it, email it, or uh, you know, send it any other way but by mail. Send a package to someone. Um, the value of actual, physical, tangible uh, something, a, a, a letter of thanks written. Uh, um, with a quill and a feather, no, not really, <laughs> but a letter of, of, of thanks written versus an email uh, is that much more impressive. And it's, I mean, it's, it is what it is. I'm not going to be an old guy, but it's, it's almost shocking when people get something by, by mail. So I say, I say use paper. Uh, we have two more minutes, but I've done the analytics that it's Friday at 6. So I figured out that if I let you out of here at 5.58, I'm a better moderator. So thank you to uh, thank Mav, you. Marie, thank Matt, Dawn, Cole. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Awesome.